Howdy y'all. We just hit 20,000 subscribers and I couldn't be happier. It's because of contributors like you. Those who comment and view the videos and keep engaging with the content that this is possible. And I sincerely thank you. In reaching this accomplishment, I'd like to make a video that's a bit closer to home, yet it still incorporates the aspects of old world research that will help us to expand our growth and questioning of the past. In today's video, I'd like to discuss with you the team boat, the horse boat, or the horse ferry. Looking through these images, all said to be from the mid 1800s, and looking over some rather revealing blueprints of these devices, we see the earliest renditions of this machine essentially involved one or more horses walking around the deck of a boat, the horses being attached to a central gear, which when rotated, provided power. While the photographs appear to show simple, or even makeshift designs, when we look into the details of how these machines operated, we can see just how important they are to engineering history. Horse boats, in their finest forms, utilized a version of the capstan, known aptly as the horse capstan. This device, which could be employed in more than just boats or ferries, essentially provided the old world power of a capstan, which we've seen depicted in so many old world construction sites and photographs, without the use of human manpower. The horse boat was considered to be a new world or North American invention, with the first documented horse ferry occurring in the year of 1791 on the Delaware River. The horse boat became very popular along the east coast of America. The horse boat eventually became so advanced to the point of actually refining, some would say creating, an advanced mechanism where the horses would no longer need to circle the boat to generate the power. The horses who circled the boat took up a lot of space and they often caused imbalance to the boat. So instead, a new device was said to be created where the floor beneath the horse would actually rotate itself, allowing the horses to walk in place while still generating power for the boat. This creation, which became known commonly as a treadmill, is the precursor for the 1950s home exercise device. However, it was actually first refined and utilized to generate power on horse boats over 150 years earlier. These horse boats eventually became pretty reliable sources of transportation, and horse boats, including one named the Experiment, were being built over 100 feet in length. What's notable about the Experiment is, and this is where things become really worth note, is the Experiment horse boat was apparently the first boat of significance in history to utilize a screw propeller. Screw propeller being the technical term for the propeller that we see on nearly every modern boat. So. Without the horse boats, we really would not have modern day boat technology. And to take this one step further and to bring this back full circle, we also have some interesting dating of these horse boats, which I have uncovered in my research. As I mentioned, we were told the first successful horse boat documented in history occurred in 1791 on the Delaware River. In doing research into Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, I discovered Wrightsville was once known as Wrights Ferry. This was one of the earliest towns established in all of the Pennsylvania colony. It is agreed upon in 1726 was the founding of Wright's Ferry. What I find peculiar is the ferry in multiple resources is written to have been an animal powered ferry. When I follow all the links regarding animal powered ferry, it continues to tie me back to the horse boat, essentially claiming Wright's Ferry was a horse boat since the year of 1730. This would make Wright's Ferry the oldest horse boat, but this also leads us to a new set of questions. We have documents which show that Wright's Ferry was established in 1726 as a quote, ferry town, which sprung up around the inn and the pub, which were at the end of the animal powered ferry. This implies that a ferry of some kind was already existent before 1726. 
yet we're told Wright's Ferry did not begin the ferry operation until 1730. Oddly, Wright's Ferry, now known as Wrightsville, has some really interesting history as well. First, the city of Lancaster is established in 1730, the exact same year that Wright's Ferry officially opened. Coincidence? Possibly. However, we have an interesting tidbit mentioned here, which being from Lancaster, I've never heard mentioned before. We're told Wright's Ferry actually changed its name to Columbia in 1789, as Wright's Ferry was being considered a location for the new capital of America. If that's not indicative of just how important this landscape was, I'm not sure what is. The narrative continues by telling us that Wright's Ferry, which became Columbia, only lost by one single vote in becoming the nation's capital. Lancaster, in general, was home to an immense population of Susquehannock Native Americans. The history of the Susquehannock in the area is well documented, and yet this is also where I believe a real clue to our past comes to light. We see little to no indigenous works being identified or protected in Lancaster. Groups like the Smithsonian did not emerge until well into the 1800s. For the years before that, we don't really have any narrative dedicated to identifying or protecting earthworks in and around Pennsylvania, including in Lancaster. Everything outside the city limits was open to claim and destruction. We have a set of land grabs and indigenous history essentially being covered up, and I believe Lancaster could have once been vast with ancient relics and larger constructions, as indicated in the stories of the tribes of Lancaster. I believe when the immigration happened and the indigenous people left the Lancaster area or were forced to leave the Lancaster area, their earthworks were then covered over. I believe this is the same reason that Wright's Ferry in Lancaster almost became the capital of the country because just how important the earthwork there once was. However, I digress. Looking back into the horse boat, the first of which may actually stem from Lancaster, let us try to bring this now full circle. We are told while the mechanisms in the horse boat led to both modern day propellers and modern day treadmills, we are also told in the same narrative, the thing that destroyed the growth of the horse boat and left them relatively unknown today was the creation of the steamboat. Steamboats essentially took the world by storm as most steam powered equipment was doing at that time. While many men have their hand in the crafting and refining of steamboat technology, in America, one man is credited as creating the steamboat. That is Robert Fulton. I've made a previous video on Fulton, which I will link down below, but why I thought he is worth mentioning in this horse boat narrative is because he too is from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Another coincidence? It seems like the dates or possibly even the locations of these original creations could have been slightly tweaked. However, I'll wrap up the video by discussing one more aspect that I believe ties into this overarching narrative. That is the Columbia Wrightsville Bridge. I've also made a previous video on the bridge, which I will link below. To keep it brief, the bridge was supposedly built in 1812 across the Susquehanna River where Wrights Ferry used to travel. At this point, one side of the shore is Columbia and the other side is known today as Wrightsville, the bridge being the link between the two. Now the first bridge was built on stone platforms, which were said to be piers. These piers entirely supported the bridge. The bridge was over one mile long and was entirely over the water, with a platform or pier being perfectly placed in intervals to support this construction. The piers are built out of stone masonry and at least 30 stretched across the mile wide Susquehanna River. The bridge on top was said to be designed in the fashion of a modern day home at that time. The bridge was not stone or brick, but was instead built out of wood. However, the bridge was said to really look like a home. It was built in the rarely seen covered bridge style being completely enclosed, having walls and a finished roof. The interior of the bridge was large enough to allow two carriages and those on foot to travel through at the same time. The bridge was said to be fully finished on the inside, including painted walls, windows, furniture, and artwork. 
the bridge allowed access to the roof, which was used for leisurely activities. The bridge also allowed entrance to the bridge from below from the piers, indicating some sort of external doors were also created. The bridge, as mentioned, stood on the stone platform situated over a mile-wide river, and all of this was built in 1812. I will conclude with some open-ended questions here. First, how were the platforms set into place? They are masonry built using fine stonework in the middle of a flowing river. The Susquehanna, while not deep, is somewhat treacherous, being difficult to maneuver or too shallow for large boats and too rapid or violent for small boats. What exactly was being used to create these platforms and piers, let alone the bridge on top? The Susquehanna can reach depths of 40 feet or more near its center. Without any modern equipment of any kind, who went to the river floor to lay the stonework for these piers? Who built the original bridge so luxurious? We are told the original bridge in all of its glory stood for nearly 30 years before being lost to quote weather. After that, it was rebuilt, albeit less extravagant. We have pictures of the second, third, fourth, and fifth renditions of this bridge. However, it truly sounds like the original bridge, founded in 1812, was the most glorious. Who was the mathematical genius behind the first bridge? Again, imagine how perfect the math would need to be to have a bridge made of wood, basically laid on top of stonework for over a mile across a river. The bridge itself being as detailed in design as most homes of that time. If any minor angle was off, any minor detail overlooked, the bridge would simply be lost. It would not last. Yet we have stonework that is laid into the riverbed, which meets perfectly at the surface of the water to create a stable environment for a bridge to be laid upon. It is absolutely fascinating that all of this happened in 1812 using mules and horses. Finally, I must pose the question, do you think a larger structure made of stone could have existed here previously? Could the piers and the platforms possibly be the foundations of something even earlier? I believe I'm going to wrap up the video there. Currently, the bridge that we see today is a more modern construction that occurred in the early 1900s. However, that bridge is also very beautiful. I just want to conclude by asking you about your thoughts and comments on the subjects discussed in the video. I will leave relevant links down below so you can further your research, including links to my previous videos on the related topics. I'd love to hear what you think about the horse boat, the horse capstan, the origins of the modern propeller, Robert Fulton, river travel, or the massive bridge at Wright's Ferry, which at the time was the largest covered bridge ever constructed. So let's break down this narrative in the comments below. Thank you so much for helping me to reach 20,000 subscribers. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to all of you. And I will talk to you very soon on the next video.